Welcome to AP Chemistry at Hyundai High School. I'm Brian Brown. Tonight we'll be looking at our fifth set of notes over Chapter 17, dealing with Section 17.4, Solubility Equilibrium, and 17.5, factors that really affect equilibrium. Now consider the equilibrium that exists in a saturated solution of barium sulfate in water. So we have barium sulfate. If you dump it in water, the barium and the sulfate will dissolve and eventually the solution reaches saturation. At that point, the rate of dissolving equals the rate of recrystallization and you have an equilibrium system. So low solubility or really any ionic substance dumped into water to make it a high enough concentration that you've reached saturation uh, will give you an equilibrium reaction. So for the saturated solution, the rate of dissolving and the rate of crystallization are equal at this point. So this is another equilibrium system. Now the equilibrium constant expression for this equilibrium is known as KSP. And the KSP for the reaction on the previous page would be the concentration of BA times the concentration of SO42 minus. Remember, your reactant was a solid. Solids aren't included in the K expression. And since we're dealing with solubility of a solid, it's known as KSP, the solubility product constant. So in this particular case, the equilibrium constant is known as KSP or the solubility product. So how can we use this? What is the KSP of calcium hydroxide if a saturated solution has a concentration of 0.012 molar? Well, first you would take a look at the reaction. Remember, always write the reaction first. From there, you can write the KSP expression. So KSP would equal the concentration of Ca2 plus times the concentration of OH minus squared. Remember, raise it to the power of its coefficient. Well, since we know the solution of calcium hydroxide at saturation, and this is an idea that we have used several different times, so be careful of this. If calcium hydroxide is 0.012 molar, there's one calcium hydroxide for every one calcium, so this would be also 0.012 molar concentration at equilibrium. So every one of these gives us one of those uh, as a dissolved ion. And OH minus would be double that because if your concentration of your saturated calcium hydroxide is 0.012, you get twice as many hydroxides. So this would be double. So you end up with 0.024 molar. So if this is your saturated concentration by the stoichiometry, one of these gives you one of those and two of those. Remember that when you're using this in these problems. So at this point, you just plug it in, 0.012 times 0.024 squared. The KSP is 6.9 times 10 to negative 6. So that's one thing you could do is, given a saturated solution concentration, you should be able to determine what the KSP value is. Now remember, KSP is related to solubility, but it is not the same as solubility. It is not the same. And that's one of the things that people routinely get wrong uh, as far as a concept on the AP test or on my test. KSP is related to what the solubility concentrations are, but it's not the same thing as solubility. Now, solubility is generally expressed as the mass of solute dissolved in one liter. So typically, we write solubilities in grams per liter or grams per milliliter. Those are our two most common solution or concentration uh, for something like solubility. Now, a lot of times we end up using for concentrations molarity. You can do the same thing for solubility, so you can express it in moles per liter, but it's more typical often with solubility to deal with grams per liter or grams per milliliter. Now, if you have a solubility in grams per liter, you should be able to manipulate that from a solubility to a molar solubility of the compound. So you should understand the relationship between when you have grams per liter and what you would have to do to that to get to moles per liter. Think of simple dimensional analysis here. If I want to get rid of grams and I want to get to moles, I've got to use that. Well, what is that? Well, that would be molar mass upside down. Remember, molar mass is grams per mole. So realize there's relationships between these that you should be able to manipulate back and forth. And if you have a molar solubility in moles per liter, you should be able to determine what is the molar concentration of the ions. And that was something we looked at in the previous problem. If we knew what BaOH2's concentration was when it was saturated, we should be able to find out the concentration of this ion and the concentration of that ion in solution. And then finally, you should be able to take molar concentrations and get to KSP and work backwards from all these. So if the KSP for calcium hydroxide is 6.9 times 10 to the negative 6, calculate the solubility of calcium hydroxide in grams per liter. 
Now remember, we always start with the reaction so we can see what the solubility expression is. In this case, the equilibrium we're looking at is a KSP. And based on the balanced equation, it would be the concentration of calcium times the concentration of hydroxide squared. Now, in this particular problem, initially, we're going to have 100% calcium hydroxide solid. We throw it in water, but before we've done that, we have zero amounts of our two ions. Now, from there, when we throw it in water, we know that our calcium concentrations through stoichiometry are going to be related to what we started with. So for every one calcium hydroxide that dissolves, we're going to get one calcium 2 plus ion. So when this thing dissolves, calcium is going to go up by x, and hydroxide is going to go up twice as fast, because they're at 2 based on the stoichiometry. So that's going to increase by 2x. So at equilibrium, and remember, these are solids, so they're moot. At equilibrium, we would have the expression that with respect to x, the calcium concentration would be x, and the hydroxide concentration would be 2x. Well, up here, we can take and plug these two numbers in those two spots, or I should say those two variables expressions in those two spots, and the KSP expression becomes this. This should look familiar. You did this last year in honors chemistry. So this is right out of honors chemistry last year. So in this particular case, KSP would equal the concentration of x times the quantity 2x squared, which is 4x squared times x, or 4x cubed. Divide by 4, take the cube root, and you have your value for x. Now remember, x is the concentration of calcium, and it would be the concentration doubled to get hydroxide, because remember, it was two hydroxides. And that would also represent the solubility of calcium hydroxide. Now, if that's our concentration, remember, that's moles per liter, and we wanted the solubility in terms of grams per liter. That was what was expressed in the problem. We need to get rid of moles, and we need to get to grams. So this is just a molar mass application, and you end up with 0.89 grams per liter. Why two sig figs? Go back to our K value. Two sig figs there. Now, section 17.5 gets into factors that affect solubility. So in this section, what we're really going to do is examine three factors that can affect the solubility of ionic compounds. So we're building on what we looked at in last section. Now, one thing that can affect things is the presence of common ions. Another thing that can affect things is the potential for pH uh, to affect solubility. And then finally, the presence of complexing agents. And that's something that we've talked about, coordinate covalent complex Ions, metal, uh, metallic ions often do that with a variety of different substances, water, ammonia, and a number of other things. So we're also going to look at how when we form complex th uh, ions, that can have an effect on our solubility. So we're going to look at this from three different points of view. Now, common ion effect this is exactly what we looked at earlier. Remember when I talked about common ion effect, I said it's going to pop up when we get into buffers. It's also going to pop up when we get into KSPs later. If one of the ions in the solution at equilibrium is already dissolved in solution, and we increase that concentration, that's going to increase or shift equilibrium to the left, and that will decrease the solubility of the salt. So another application of comp common ion effect is for a low solubility solid, when you increase the concentration of one of the product ions, in other words, add a common ion, it decreases the solubility of the solid. When you go to do this, remember this is exactly what we did earlier. You're going to set up an ice box. So you're going to look at what the uh, situation is at time zero when we haven't dissolved any. And then we're going to add a common ion to one of those. And they're going to go up by x. Remember, it could be x or 2x, depending on the uh, number of ions in the formula. And from there, you're going to work it like an ice box problem. So common ion effect is something that we can handle also with low solubility substances. Common ion effect movie. Take a look at it online. If not, we'll end up watching it in class. Now, solubility and pH. If you take a look at magnesium hydroxide in solution after it dissolves, you'll see that one of the products here is the hydroxide ion. So of course, pH can have an effect on this, because adding hydroxide is adding a common ion. That shifts equilibrium to the left, lowering solubility. And remember, if we add an acid that will react with this, making water, effectively lowering the concentration of the hydroxide. And that's going to increase 
the solubility of the magnesium hydroxide. So if a substance has a basic anion, it will be more soluble in an acidic solution. And that's because the acid will react with the hydroxide, shifting equilibrium to the right, and increasing the solubility. By the same token, common ion effect, you can decrease the solubility by adding hydroxide, so adding a basic solution. Substances with acidic cations are more soluble in basic solutions. So if you end up producing an ion that uh, is acidic, the exact opposite is going to happen. So pH can have an effect. Once again, there's a short movie that deals with this that you will watch in class, and it's also posted online. Now, a, an application of this idea is what you see in the picture here. Um, underneath what used to be a series of buildings and a road here, and this whole area collapsed, a large sinkhole, what basically happened is you had a substrate rock that was calcium carbonate. Well, calcium carbonate is a low solubility solid, so it doesn't dissolve very much. But when it does, it forms calcium 2 plus ions and the carbonate ion. Well, if you can do something to shift equilibrium to the right, you're going to increase the solubility of the calcium carbonate, and literally the ground will dissolve underneath those buildings until it collapses. Well, what could do that? Well, remember carbonate, the CO3 2 minus ion, can react with an acid here to form hydrogen carbonate which is another ion, but in other words, dumping in an acid will take away carbonate, shifting equilibrium to the right, dissolving more calcium carbonate. So acid rain seeping down into the bedrock can literally cause fissures to appear in the ground underneath the surface as the calcium carbonate slowly dissolves over time, making the ground unstable and collapsing. Now, to apply that idea, to finish up here, we're going to look at predicting the effect of solubility um, when you add an acid here. So which of the following ions will be more soluble in acidic solution than in a basic solution? So you have to go back to what we talked about before, evaluating what you've got here. So if we have nickel hydroxide, nickel hydroxide will dissolve to give you hydroxide ions. If you dump in an acid, you'll draw this away, shifting equilibrium to the right, making it more soluble. So that would be yes. Next one, calcium carbonate. We just looked at this idea. Carbonate can also react with a hydrogen to form hydrogen carbonate. So yes, this will increase in solubility if you put an acid in, because this is the conjugate of a base of a weak acid. Remember, conjugates of strong, negligible. Conjugates of weak have acid-base properties. And the next one, barium fluoride. Barium hydroxide is a strong base, so that's going to be negligible. But fluoride is a conjugate of hydrofluoric acid. So it will react with acid. So the F minus, which is created when this thing dissolves, will be a product. So adding an acid would create hydrofluoric acid, taking away F minus. So yes, that will react with an acid, shifting equilibrium to the right. Now last one, silver chloride. No, because in this particular case, the chloride anion, remember, is the conjugate of a strong. That's negligible in basicity. So the chloride just isn't going to react, shifting equilibrium to the right when we add an acid. And that ends our fifth set of notes over chapter 17.